an exercise in empathy. Mm -hmm. Like that's what all good writing is. I'm no longer important. It's the audience. What does the audience expect? And how do you pleasantly subvert that expectation? On the 70th episode of Passion in Progress, we talk copywriting with writer Nick Gaudio. In my own journey as a content creator, entrepreneur, whatever that class may be, I've found that copywriting is one of the spots that I'm lacking in the most. And to be honest, writing good copy for any of your content will allow your audience to understand a better idea of what your brand image is, as well as create value for them in the most efficient way when they're reading any of the copy that is presented with your content. If that makes any sense, Nick is way better at explaining all of this kind of stuff during the podcast. Nick has a master's degree in writing from the University of Michigan, and he taught writing at the University of Maryland. He's been a writer for the Chive.com, Classic Dad, and National Lampoon, and currently he runs the email list accounts for Rev.com, Sattva, Kitspo, and 10 other businesses. I just want to remind everybody that to help me out with this podcast, I am on Patreon if you want to support me that way. And if not, please share this podcast out with a friend. Any episode that you find value in, please share it out, tweet it, text it, share it on Facebook, YouTube, whatever that may be. Without further ado, let's go ahead and hop into this amazing episode with Nick Gaudio about the art of copywriting. What is up, Merce Nation? Javier Mercedes here for yet again another Passion in Progress show where we talk to inspiring individuals and hopefully through hearing their stories, you too are motivated to go out and pursue your passions. And on today's episode, we are diving into the world of writing copy on the screen, on print, and getting that information to the masses. That's right. With Nick Gaudio. Glad to be here, Javi. For the audience, can you give a little spiel of what you do day to day right now? I am the head of email marketing for Rev.com, which is a transcription and captioning service. And I also run my own email marketing firm slash copywriting firm, uh, Convict and Canon here in Austin. From my perspective as a content creator, one of the things that I love is video. One of the things that I'm lacking at is copy. Yeah. Yep. Can you explain the importance of a copywriter in today's day and age of the internet? You know, there's a lot of people out there who think that they, because they went through like basic high school that they can write, right? Like, in fact, I think that whenever I was at the Chive, because that's where we, we met, mm-hmm. um, which I forgot to mention, but um, I think John and Leo sent out a, an email. Those are the owners of the Chive, uh, Yeah, by that's the way. right. Yeah. <laughs> they sent out a email saying, you guys went to college, you can write your own copy. Whenever I moved from copywriter to email. Um, after about two years, I was there. And, you know, I, I think that there's that assumption that just because you can write, you have the, the uh, innate ability to be a, like a fantastic copywriter right off the bat. And that's just not the way it works. It's definitely a practice skill. Just like anything else, if you practice it and you do it, you'll get better at it. Mm-hmm. You know, knowing how to talk to people and how to meet them where they're at is crucial, especially now when there's just so much noise in the advertising world. That's basically where it comes from, I think, is that just because you can put words down that they'll affect people. But being a practice copywriter is understanding your audience Them and going from there. What I'm really curious about in this regard is email marketing. Sure. And where is it at now? I think that it's still climbing. I think that it, as far as I know, is the highest ROI per channel still. Mm-hmm. Um, and that the technology is evolving and that we're going to be able to do more and more things as email clients get kind of hip to it. Like, you know, there are still um, email clients out there that don't play GIFs. I know a lot of people know what a GIF is, but right. can you explain what yeah, a like, GIF is? Like a moving uh, JPEG. You know, like yeah, a, the like animated, a, animated GIFs is exactly. what he's talking about. It's those um, repeating loops of animated exactly. video. Exactly. Um, you know, and I think that they're going to be, you know, video, embedded video in, in email. I think that... Um, you know, it's, it's not going anywhere. Like, you know, there have been plenty of places that are trying to, you know, upend it. And, and at the end of the day, it's still the me- the main means of communication that people have with each other. Yeah. So for those that don't know, Nick has been in charge of the email lists of very big brands. Sure. So he is responsible for getting those eyeballs and getting that traffic to the site mm-hmm. for somebody that is looking to start an email list or just to connect to their audience, what are some of the things that need to go through their head when applying, um, when just writing an email to somebody? Okay. I mean, that's a big question. I mean, yeah, (laughs) yeah. yeah. yeah, There's, there's like, you know, 10 or 12 points of like a really good email program, but whenever somebody gives you their email address, that's sort of like a pact that they're making with you. 
they're saying, hey, you know, I'm interested in what you're doing and, you know, don't betray me, right? Mm -hmm. Like, don't, se don't like send my email to other people. Don't give me stuff that I don't want, you know, like, don't, like, if you're saying, you know, subscribe to our newsletter, don't like spam them and send them promotional ads every day. You're establishing a rapport with a customer who's like moving down the funnel for you, right? Like they're they're no longer this person who's just like like an average nobody, right? They're they're actually somebody who's saying, Your brand has intrigued me enough that I'm allow you to talk to me. And that's that's kind of like a little covenant that they're making with you. Like that's a promise. And you don't want to betray that. And that's like the first like major thing. And I think that that's why I've had success as a email marketers because I treat every time I communicate with people very seriously. Like there has to be a reason. And I call it the occasion. Um, like what's the occasion that I'm, I'm communicating with you? And if it's not good, then I kind of have to go back to the drawing board and say, there has to be a reason why I'm communicating with you. You know, there's different policies for different types of email, right? Like a media list, getting click throughs. And then there's value based emails that you're just providing everything within that email. Usually you have a lot more success with those value emails because you're providing something to these people who otherwise wouldn't get anything. Uh, whether that's content, how-tos, that's going to build a rapport and a relationship with your subscriber. And they're way more likely to open other things that you do and spend money with you or get your services or whatever you want them to do. They're much more likely to um, use you if they trust you. How often would you say you email and how much of a percentage or ratio is of value email compared to then, a promotional? Yeah. yeah. You know, it really just depends. Uh, uh, you know, different marketers have different beliefs and different brands have different promises that they can make, right? For instance, I was like writing emails for a mattress brand, right? Yeah. Now, I'm not going to email them every day about mattresses. They're going to unsubscribe pretty much like after two days, right? Yeah. But whenever we had a sale, you know, there's promotional. That's, that's the occasion is you need to know this because we're having a sale. And we, we figured we're going to come to you in good faith and let you know that this is what we're doing. That is in and of itself a reason to email people. And then they see that. They're like, well, you know, I don't need a mattress right now, but it's worthwhile information to know. So I'm not going to unsubscribe because that's what you're really you're, you're trying to stay top of mind and you're trying to not get them to unsubscribe or hate your brand. Right. Mm -hmm. That's the two things that you really want to do. You want to like staying top of mind wasn't important. Email wouldn't really need to be to exist as a form. You know, for the chive, especially like people could just go to the chive.com and look at all the stuff that I'm sending them in a day. There's nothing different between what I'm sending in these promo emails other than just saying, hey, look, we have this new content. We think you figured you'd be you think it's cool. So here it is. Right. Mm -hmm. It's curating the curation in a way. Right. But that's what email is. It's like the, the top of mind channel. Mm -hmm. Right. It's sort of like that annoying friend where, or like a friend who like just comes around too much. You're like, all right, you don't need to tell me about you, <laughs> yourself. You know, like we're good. You know, mm -hmm. some marketers say like three value emails to one promo. Okay. Uh, I try to abide by that. Um, some email lists don't want any promos whatsoever. Like I don't run, um, you know, direct uh, single send ads on the chive list right now. Mm -hmm. um, and some expect nothing but ads. It just depends on that point of sign up what you're what you're telling people, right? Like what what they're expecting to get in their inboxes, past the point of that initial give, handing over of their email. And even then, no matter what you do, no matter how clearly you explain it, you're going to get unsubs. That's what like a lot of people are just they get kind of like demoralized when they see like one percent of every time they send leaves their list. That's just what happens. I mm -hmm. mean, maybe a, it should be a little less than one percent, um, pr probably half a percent ideally, um, but you're going to lose people because they're going to make that the, there's, there's just like something lost in translation there. Yeah. Right? Like you could say, I am going to send you literally this every day and still by the end of the week, you're going to lose. So in percent of people, the thing that pops up in order to get somebody's email, what, what's that called? That is uh well, it just depends, but it's a modal, like an exit intent modal. A lot of the no. time uh, companies will have those pop up um, when they think that people are like, making moves on the page that are indicative of leaving right like mm -hmm. maybe their cursor goes up to the x and then they pop up right <laughs> like, it, before it, you go right would you like to subscribe yeah 15 percent off mm -hmm. or whatever mm -hmm. um and those actually tend to work better than like passive capture things in the bottom um i've seen like numbers three or four percent better um so oh, wow. whenever you're driving a lot of traffic to a website that that can mean a big difference um than just having like a little um because people just 
Um, it's sort of like why call to actions work better than just not having them. It's because mm-hmm. people need to, that a little that little bit to like that little suggestion to do things. Um, that makes the difference. Um, and people are so used to it. I think that it doesn't really turn off people to see that. You yeah. Know? Um, so I think it's worth your time. Um, and I have used um, Sumo Me. I think is the one that I. I'll have to come back to you and make sure that's mm-hmm. what it's called. But it, yeah, that's because um, it's like pretty great out of the box. Okay. Um, if, if if people are looking for a a good little pop up thing, yeah, exactly. Does that integrate into WordPress? Yes, it does. Okay. And Squarespace, as far as I know. Oh, awesome. Yeah. So they might have changed their business model since since I've set up those. They usually let that like engineering handle that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. You're just in charge of putting the text on the screen. So for every email that you send for a larger list, you're, you're segmenting out different people. And I highly recommend you always do that. Um, really? Yeah. Can you, can you dive into that? There are different metrics that allow you to d- make decisions on who you're going to send. For, so for instance, with Rev, um, we have so many different types of customers who need transcription and captioning, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, videographers need captioning. And then there's like students who need transcriptions of like lecture notes and stuff like that. I'm not going to send the same messaging to the people who, ah. you know what I'm saying? So how do you look at your list and you're like, well, I, I don't know how to segment out people based on whether they're a student or whether they're a videographer just by email, right? You think that. But then you say, okay, wait a second. Students tend to have a .edu email address, right? Mm-hmm. So then you go in and you say, you tell it like MailChimp or Constant Contact or whatever you're using, find me the, the .edu emails and then you segment them out, and then you send them specific message, a specific message, right? It goes sort of back to this idea of the occasion of the email, right? Like, yeah. I don't want to send videographers stuff about, like, use this at your next lecture. They're just gonna be like, "Well, I don't, this does is this brand completely not what I'm thinking it is?" Or it just like confuses people, right? Yep. So you know, the idea is to use the what you can from the data that you collect, and actually, you know, domains and emails give a lot away just in and of a themselves really yeah personally i the problem that i'm having or the challenge is that i have my podcast right which sure. can breach a whole bunch of different topics and then i am a video editor and i make video editing tutorials sure. and building my email list i think to myself well when i send out something let's say i have a uh a preset pack for Premiere Pro okay. for people that follow my podcast for inspiration. I don't know if they're going to want a preset pack on Premiere Pro. Right. So what you're saying is uh, the lead magnet. That's the the term that I was going to sure. say. So if you set it up in a way that maybe if people that went to my podcast site and I knew that they were there for the podcast. Mm-hmm. And if, if would there be a way of segmenting that out to say all right if everybody that signed up for my email list on the website send this email about podcasting to them yeah. and then everybody that kind of got it from my youtube videos send it to them right for the, okay yeah you would you would put them in different audiences mm-hmm. and like you know the, you you can collect a okay so the way you should see it is every time you ask for a little bit of data m- more data you're gonna lose people right mm-hmm. you know you're like i want your first name your last name your occupation uh your daughter's middle name yeah, yeah, so yeah you're yeah. like you're losing like two percent of people every time you ask that kind of question mm-hmm. so like you know keep it in mind that you gotta you gotta kind of play it off one one or the other but if you know where they're coming from yeah you can send them to different audiences what would you say is a better uh way to approach that then what is it better to get more information and you're just going to lose the people by putting in because i i've i asked myself this too it's do I just get a whole bunch of emails and all you have to do is put in your email or mm-hmm. do you get first, last name, email and right. things things of that nature? Right. Well, it, again, it just depends on what you, you know, so test, right? Mm-hmm. Like test it. Like first month, ask for those things, get a number. And then the next month, don't and see what the difference is, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's it. And say, okay, is this difference worth it to me? You know, is like, are people, am I getting like 10% of emails or like 10% of people who come to my website giving me their email just for asking email and that shrink down to 2% for asking for their first and last name, Mm -hmm. then it's not worth it, right? But different, like different businesses can get away with it in different ways. Like B2B can get away with it in a way that B2C, uh, business to business emails, right? So B2C, B2C, uh, business to consumer, right? So like, you know, or certain like serious brands can get away with asking sort of 
questions like what industry are you in whereas like if i did on like the chai people are like what the why the hell are you asking that that's so true right i feel I, well i feel like rev would be able to do something like that right. whereas I, I was just on adobe's website and mm. they were asking the same kind of questions and sure. it makes sense because hey i want them to make the best products so i can continue to use their software right and if they know more about their audience then more power to them sure and well there's also sneakier ways to do it right like just having a like a click box after like if you're if you're providing a service and you're getting all this information anyway and just saying sign up for our newsletter and then mm -hmm. that that's all you need. I mean you 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 definitely need like opt in. I mean that's like the law, so you have to do that. But, yeah. Um, you know that can give you all sorts of data points. So with Rev, for instance, I mean when they place an order, there's a certain amount of data that I I get from them just simply because they give they willingly give us that we you know when we're very clear what what they've given us mm -hmm. and we put that into Mailchimp and then we say okay, um, this product is very useful to people in California or this is in this industry or or they you know only people who have used both our services will will find this inter this promotion interesting right yeah so like. What, what kind of people use caption and transcription like yourself? There aren't mm -hmm. that many people, but there are certain products and services and, and promos and things that we do that it's really germane for you to know about. So I want to I want to be able to pull that information. Right. Mm -hmm. And then that goes back to what copyright, great copywriting, because then you know your audience. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you know your audience, you can tinker. the You know, we we send emails to people we know are teachers. Right. And then we use in in industry language to them like learning outcomes and heuristic and you know like <laughs> like we have to we have to do a little research but at the end of the day like you know it, it makes us feel part of the in group and then they're more likely to trust what we're saying they're more likely to you know buy what we're doing it's always dipping your toe in the water because whenever you do that and you take data that they're not otherwise like saying okay uh you know you, you can't give weight that you know too much too because that's like it's a little creepy, right? Yeah. You know, like sometimes I think cart abandonment emails, like when people put, um, like they buy like a bike and they put it in their cart, but then they leave or something happens and they don't purchase it. Yeah. And then the the brand emails you like, hey, we saw you had this bike. Uh, do you, you want to get it? Like cart abandonment emails do really well, but there are people still like old school people who feel really creeped out that that's happening, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then to go a step farther is browse abandonment when there's no commitment to that product whatsoever. And and then you say something like, "Hey, we saw you were looking at this thing." People are like, "That's that's creepy, man." And I don't. It doesn't doesn't do as well, right? In certain brands, yeah, right? for sure. And and it's also messaging, right? Like if you were just to say, "Hey, there's this thing that we think you might like," that, that kind of like buffers it a little bit, right? Yeah. As opposed to saying, "We saw you. You were it was eleven ten p.m. <laughs> and we liked what you were wearing." Right? <laughs> That creeps people out, right? Like you want to build trust with them and know that you respect them as people and you respect their time and that you're uh, coming to them in good faith. These are all like really thematic things, but those are the things that I'm always thinking about when I'm writing an email. If you have like a touchstone belief system that dictates what you do, I think that that ends up being the reason things are successful. That's awesome. It reminds me of music theory and the fact that even Western music theory exists is when I went to the school of music, the fact when you put rules on something it breeds more creativity and in, in yeah. my opinion because you have to play within those rules right. and by setting those rules it gives you at least a little bit of a map as mm -hmm. to where to start and where to take your if you ever have a decision you can go back to in in this case whatever your beliefs are and say all right here's a here's b mm -hmm. according to my beliefs where would i go with this right. this um phrasing yeah they, they say a constraint is the mother of invention right like that's or necessity but i think constraint really mm -hmm. is and um that when it, i i've never met an email marketer and it's not a very big community but you know we talk to each other a lot and that who who has these like beliefs that's unsuccessful mm -hmm. like if you if you really value your list and you're not like just treating them as like cattle to, you know, to herd into certain directions and you treat them as people, generally you're going to be pretty successful at what you're doing. Awesome. I think that works across all marketing, but email particularly, because there's this like, there's this like weird intimacy that happens getting in their inboxes that otherwise doesn't happen when it's like a billboard. Right? Yeah, for sure. So w speaking of successes, do you have a specific example that you could tell of some time when you actually hit a home run with uh, either 
here's a product that you thought, all right, how do I give this to these people? And then all of a sudden you, you wrote the copy and then there was a huge amount of click through to whatever that thing was. Sure. Um, there was a bike clothing company that I worked with for a while. Mm-hmm. I'm not a bike guy. Um, I haven't ridden. I actually got invited out there and they took me on a bike ride and I was like, they're like going up and down hills and it's like a 16 mile bike ride. And I was like, <laughs> you guys really should have warned me uh, about this. So it was like, it was really hard to sort of get into that mindset. They had different types of clothing because there are different types of cyclists, right? So yeah. mountain bikers and road bikers and gravel bike. I didn't even know that existed. You know, the first was about gathering information that would allow me to segment out specific types of audiences to approach in different ways, right? So they're like, okay, we have this clientele who they tend to be like older dudes who ride their bikes on the street, right? And they're like 60 and they make a lot of money. And and it was actually like high quality stuff. So it was like $300 for a shirt. So it's kind of hard to sell people as opposed to like $20 or whatever. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Whatever a reasonable amount is for a bike. I don't know, right? Yeah, yeah. Because I'm not of that world. But so $300, that's a lot of money, right? So mm-hmm. we want to make sure that when we, when we approach these guys that, you know, we want it to feel like luxury, right? We want it to feel like have an air about it, right? That like the brand is like super amped up and just like really important and just like luxurious, right? There's no yeah, other yeah, way yeah. to put it. We got data based on their past purchase history. We got data based on the things that they were looking at on the website. There was some software called Segment that I really like. And we built these personas um, based on what kind of, you know, what kind of people were buying, what kind of things. One of my favorite things that I did was we had this specific shirt that those older dudes liked a lot, mm-hmm. right? We had our limited run of these shirts. They had limited sizes. Well, for some reason, medium sold out really fast. So I was like, look, large dudes, mediums went out really fast. We have, we have like 40 large shirts left. And we specifically emailed those dudes who we knew were in our persona, right? Like the, that audience. They may have already bought a large a lar- shirt. A large shirt and any other thing, right? Mm-hmm. And we sold those out in like maybe 30 minutes. Holy it was like that. cow. Yeah. It was really crazy because there was like you, you created this like, sense of urgency right and some scarcity and yeah the sense of scarcity and i went to them and was just like look mediums like the medium guys just they're out of luck now do you want to be like those guys probably not so you know we we saw that you wanted large you bought large and we were like completely crystal clear and transparent about why we were contacting them there was no like breach of trust or privacy and i i can't remember the messaging but it was you know it was basically just you know, really the, sincere. The, the, yeah, these are the facts. That's it's still salesy, but in yeah. a way that look, this is how this was, right? And you could, if you want to get on on it, you got to do it now, right? And like I said, it was amazing. And it was funny because like I worked with them a couple other times, and one time I accidentally sent an email out um, a little early, and that ended up winning out. They had told me um, time on the, they had told me like a time, and I had actually sent it we were in different time zones yeah so i got the wires crossed and i ended up sending it two hours early and they were like oh no we we weren't ready and then i had to send an apology email and the apology email on that ended up blowing up so it was crazy what? like you're just yeah the apology email made people go back to the other email and our open rates went through the roof too because people are like well these guys don't mess up very often and that like maybe that little moment of vulnerability or something made us seem more human but we yeah we sold out of that product too really quickly so isn't that wow, weird? Yeah. That, I bet there's somebody listening to this podcast now that wants to just implement that on you can try it. You, on- <laughs> yeah, that's the thing, though. Like, if it comes off as insincere, then people are like, what kind of weird marketing, you know? Can you talk about the uh, just being authentic with who you are on top of you work with a lot of different brands? Yeah. So how do you in and of yourself speak on behalf of a brand? And you were just talking about for bikes. You're right. not a cyclist yourself. No. So how how do you approach that mm-hmm. and still be authentic? Right. An exercise and empathy. Mm-hmm. Like that's what all good writing is. Like you you take you're like I'm no longer important. It's the audience. So what are the what does the audience expect? And how do you pleasantly subvert that expectation? That's how you write a good email, right? So you 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 match their expectations where they need to be met, right? So like there's certain rules with everything you do, right? Like if I'm sending a, a, a email about mattresses, people expect certain things about that email, right? They mm-hmm. just we're all like experts in ads because we see a thousand of them a minute, right? Like yeah. ads are everywhere. So we, we kind of get it. But then there's those expectations where we can kind of say, well, maybe a little bit of a you know puns are fun and and things like that so like 
I remember for Valentine's Day, we wanted a campaign um, for mattresses. And I was like, you know, what, what can I do with that? And they're like, you know, stay away from sex. And I said, okay. So really nothing, right? <laughs> no, like it's Valentine's Day and the mattresses. So I was like, you know, and I start, and I think the, 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 uh, the campaign we ran was, you had me at pillow. Ah! So, right? And that killed it. <laughs> title of the yeah, email that was the subject line somebody else that owns a mattress company that's listening to this yeah <laughs> yeah yeah you had me at pillow and we were giving away a free pillow with the mattress so it really it worked it was it really gelled you know that's awesome yeah so. es- especially if people are looking for that kind of content because they've already been on that list right i i think that's where email in and of itself has such a one up because you do at least have access to an audience that you know right. somewhat is enticed exactly by and that's what i was talking about with the funnel right like yeah. there's there's like the the idea is that there's this like generic amount of liquid like out there like these are these are possible people who could be you know customers right mm-hmm. and by giving them the uh, us like the you know the brand an email we move down slightly there's an expressed interest right so they're they at some point expressed interest in getting a mattress right mm-hmm they they're thinking about it, so I know. Okay, what am I going to do to get them to open this email? And subject lines are like there's like a science behind su- subject lines, um, you know. And and that was, I, I think that that got like a forty five percent open rate because people were like, oh, I get it, right? Like it was pretty quick. So mm-hmm. you get that like Jerry Maguire reference, you get the bed reference, you know. Yeah, yeah. It all it all works together, and um, you know. And then once you get them in the email, then that's that's the next step, right? But it has to like the subject line. You can't just like create like sensationalized stuff just to get clicks because then if somebody gets inside of the email and has nothing to do with that subject line, they're going to feel betrayed and mm-hmm. then they're going to go right down to the bottom of that email and click on sub and then you've lost them forever. So one of the things I want to ask about emails and where it goes in the future. Sure. For people that have things like Instagram and Facebook, Mm -hmm. messaging them privately on those apps and utilizing it the same as if it were an email, Hmm. do you see that now? I honestly don't. I think that that is maybe the future or maybe that people would be like, why is nike messaging me or whatever right like why because uh, i've already started to get it some really like, i've already started yeah. getting personal quote-unquote brands but i know it's just a bot that's sure e- and they they have a certain funnel that goes through on their dms but mm-hmm. i see instagram dms as something sacred that right. oh man somebody's sending me a personal message right. oh wow this really big influencer yeah. sending me this message and then all of a sudden I just see that it's a... That goes back to betraying people's expectations, exactly. right? <laughs> yeah. So yeah. you're like, I liked your page just because I like it, not because I want you to like reach out and contact me. Mm-hmm. And that's what email has a one up on. Again, as well, long as you get that opt in, right? Mm-hmm. Like if you get that opt in, then you know, I can contact you and I'm not like bre- breaching that sacred, like private, like, you know, like let's keep, let's just be friends, right? Like, exactly. Right? <laughs> yeah. 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 So, you know, it could go that route It like... Marketing never ceases to amaze me, like what kind of crazy stuff is happening. Mm-hmm. And like I read a, a piece the other day about how TV and phones are working together now. And like there's like this crazy um, inaudible sound that TVs are going to be playing that phones can pick up on. And they'll so they know what. Well, even to the point of something like YouTube TV, I think is genius on Google just because they already have all of the API to they they, they have the brains to already know how to implement all the analytics. Right. And if you do something like YouTube TV, they're going to know exactly when you're watching Mm -hmm. and switching a channel and what channels you're watching, all that kind of material. Yeah. You know, but going back to the bot thing, Mm -hmm. because I I really feel like this is important to know in email and email as well, because a lot of the time you get this idea that, oh, I have all this, this personalized information and what they call merge tags. So like if I have your first name and I type in like merge tag in the code and it pulls in your first name, it's like, hello, Javier, comma, I mm. noticed that people who work with your company would like to, you know, mm-hmm. there's there's a certain amount of success that that has, and then there's a certain amount of turnoff that people have because they're they feel like, hey, if you're contacting me, why don't you make it personal and like make this an actual person? Mm-hmm. Like ro- robots just don't do it as well as humans do, and that's you know, I I hope that in my lifetime a robot can't outright me, you know, <laughs> um, it might come to that eventually, but like the the human angle like there's there's nothing wrong with messing up like i said with that um that Apology miss send yeah. you know there's nothing wrong with having it a beat off 
um, it, it, you know, it makes you more human to do that. And I think that people can appreciate that, you know, you, you, you want to, um, not, you know, you, you want to be careful, like misspellings and weird sends and things like that, because that doesn't show that you care, but like people are more forgiving, I think of brands and things like that, um, than you would, you, you would think, you know, but staying human is really important, um, mm-hmm. uh, in, in copywriting and email, you know? There was a podcast I was listening to, and I didn't even realize that this was a thing. Mm -hmm. Um, And maybe you can talk about it briefly, Mm -hmm. that there's, I think, copy Bibles or just a whole... There's copywriters that are, quote unquote, so good at what they do that they've made a product that here's a thousand ways to get people into said funnel or whatever whatever it is. And we have the proven statistics to back up when I tested it with this many people. Can you talk Mm -hmm. about, uh, for those that don't know, just what I'm talking about? Sure. Okay. So there are definitely like guys who make their living testing out call to action buttons right that, that yeah okay so they, they're like or anything really like subject lines like subject lines that include the word new get a two percent bump subject lines that include the word now get a four percent bump and then you but like i would caution against using things like that because like use it as a, a framework right but mm-hmm. don't use it as the, a bible right because mm-hmm. you're like new now feature and like all these words and this is like this doesn't come off as authentic it can't, comes off as an ad and like why are you sending me this thing that's like clearly you didn't it you didn't think it through or something like that right mm-hmm. like you're way better off to test it um and a lot of email um email service providers allow these a b tests so that's why email is one of the best in, in my mind still like because you're basically like a little petri dish every time you send out something and you and you put a little drop of A in, you put a little drop of B in, and then you say, okay, they fight, and what did I learn, right, by the winner? Before you start sending out to more and more people. Exactly. Wow. Yeah, right. So, like, let's say you have a list of 1,000 people, right? Yeah. And it's, it's like, homogenous across from t- top to bottom, right? Like, everybody's the same. Uh, so, you take out 100 people, and that's about, like, statistically significant, right? Like, 100, those 100 people should be emblematic of the 1,000 people, right? As long as you randomly take them. And the math is really easy on the percentage. Right. Right. Exactly. <laughs> and then you take 50 of those people, send them a subject line. 50 other people send them a subject line that's different. Include an emoji. Do something different. Right. Wildly different things tend to be a better way of doing it. Like not just like putting an exclamation point, especially when you're early, like you get a better feel by taking these large leaps. And at the very end, if you upset people, you're only upsetting 50 people. Or if you, you turn off people, you're only turning off 50 people. And, mm-hmm. the, and, and the other one is winning. I personally would recommend getting out like a spreadsheet and saying, okay, this is what I did with A and this is what we did with B and here's what happened. And then, you know, at the end of the month, after you've done all these sends, then you get a better idea of where to go next, right? With your brand. Because, you know, as much as you like to think you have control of your brand, there is something lost in translation all the time, right? The more you test it, the better off or the closer you'll get to where, where actually it is out in the world, uh, separate from your control. Uh, I just got done reading the book called uh, Primal Branding, and mm. in it, he brings up this concept. There's a couple of different things with the code. The prim- he, ca- he calls it the primal code, and one of the big bullet points is what you're pointing out is that the brand is what people think your brand is. You can't, obviously, you can put forth what you want, right. and then it's up to them to decide where that goes, right. but in terms of what you're you're talking about, you keep A-B testing until you find what that avatar is. Exactly. And then you obviously start somewhere with right. what that customer avatar may be. Yeah. But yeah. Exactly. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. And like, it's it's sort of like, we don't know what the moon means to us, right? Like, we don't know. <laughs> like, there's just like, there's so many things out there that mean things that are just way outside of our control. And, and we can sit down and we can write them all down. But at the end of the day... How, how people look at our product or our service compared to the way we were trying to pitch it to them, the more tied together those two things are, the better, right? The more like, you know, uniform and tight that is, the better. Most brands that do really well have that sort of natural reaction to it, but you, you still won't know until you test. And there's not many other series of things where you have these people or like channels of e- uh, marketing where you can say, I know people who are interested in what I'm doing and I can test that against each other like this, like I can know like right now on my, my own personal email list, some, some fact between two testing things, right? Like I could do that. I can go home and by the end of the weekend, I could get a better idea of 
what's it like to send it on the weekend on Saturday for people with this subject line or this subject line, right? You know, you, you try to limit as many variables as you can, like a scientific method, right? That's that's sort of like why I, I sort of leaned into email. It was like, there, it's left brain and right brain. There's this like this statistical thing where you kind of, um, you know, get the framework for where you're going to go. And then there's the creative side for how, how you treat that data, right? So you're like, oh, uh, I have 35% open rate compared to a 25% open rate with these two subject lines. Why is that? And how do I emulate it without seeming like I'm being like kind of a shill and just doing it to manipulate people to open, right? Yeah. So it's like, was it the emoji? Was it that it was fun? Was it that it was honest? Was it more, was it more exciting? What, like, what was it? Was it like sexy or like what, what, what was the thing that got people to click? And then you sort of say, how do I take my, like, the, the creative side of my brain and say, okay, how do I make that again? And how do I make it fresh in a way that's that's kind of hiding your source, right? I love it because it's, in, in my world, it's YouTube. And with mm -hmm. that, there's a tool called TubeBuddy. With TubeBuddy, you can do the same thing. You can change your title and mm. you can A-B test your thumbnail. Mm. And there's a lot of information, just like what you're talking about. Sure. Um, I can guarantee you that there are so many times that I've made thumbnails for my videos and then I'll just send it out to my family and then somebody passing by the computer like, oh, what do you think of this thumbnail? And then I show them some other one mm -hmm. and they, that, the one that I thought, no, I'm not going to use that. And then everybody else always says, oh, well, what about that one? I'm like, oh, OK. It just goes mm -hmm. to show you that you are not the all encompassing person right. that knows everything about right. whatever even if it may be. you are the only sole employee of your brand, even if it's you have no control once it's out in the world, it's sort of like writing anything that you do mm -hmm. or like, you know, I, that's how I started. I was a, I'm a writer like I, yeah. I write short stories and I do other things for fun. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, once it's you can't argue with an audience who takes what you're writing and says this is what they I think it is because it should be in there, right? Mm -hmm. It's the, the the story itself or whatever it is exists outside of your control. Um, and just like a brand, that's exactly what happens. Like you, you, you can change your colors, you can change your messaging, but you know, and at the end of the day, the audience decides what the brand means. And your job is to sort of, again, meet them where they're at. Within the last say couple months, if you are taking somebody else's copy that they pre-wrote and then mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're fixing it up. What are some of the things that you notice that a lot of people do that you're fixing a lot of? One, um, adverbs, people use like anything that ends in L-Y, like you can pretty much scrap it. He said convincingly, like just he said's fine. Um, and that's just like line level stuff. Um, I, I, it, that just makes things like crisper. Mm -hmm. um, I'm always trying to make things a little bit more engaging, right? That, yeah. So how do you do that? There's there's several like making it as short as possible tends to be a good idea. So if you have anything excess, try to you know uh, there are so many tools now that exist that can help you truncate language and 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 make can you, it. Can you explain grammar? Uh, gra uh, Hemingway the Hemingway app is what I use. Mm -hmm. they, they they have a lot of um. It just basically takes your 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 language and says okay. Um, do you, you don't really need this you know? <laughs> like you know and you're like okay that's awesome yeah um and then you know because again it's one of those things where you're saying to the audience i have your time uh, you know why am i taking your time right like if if i'm not like everything that i'm telling you is important right and people are amazing at smelling out bullshit and mm -hmm. if and if you're gonna sit there and sort of like you know jump back and forth and try to just like make it too interesting or, or you know, that, that that's the issue really is like, you got to get to the point. You got to, you know, respect their time as, as an audience. Yeah. So, um, I, you know, I, I use a lot of different tools, um, generally to make things more interesting. There's like an idiom dictionary that if I know like the topic is Valentine's day, I start typing in words like heart and love. And is it like a thesaurus or what is no, it? No, like an idiom dictionary is sort of like, um, if I were f for instance, birds, right. Or bird. So I type in bird and it's like, it would be like kill two birds with one stone. Um, all the wow. all the expressions and yeah, holy cow. Yeah, all, so it's yeah, just like type in idiom dictionary. It's like the free dictionary it has its own version. Mm -hmm. um, it's really handy for subject lines. So you just like take off like you kind of break the message into different parts and you know um, it'll give you like a lot. There's a lot more than you think idioms out there. Um, rhyme zone's really fun. Rhymezone.com. Mm -hmm. I use that for like if I want to write like something that rhymes or has like a little bit of fun. Um, yeah. Um, they also have near rhyme words, so you can actually make a lot of puns with it. Mm -hmm. um, so you you type in like um, 
you type in pillow, right? Yeah. And then it says pillow has, it sounds sort of like hello. It's like a 75% match. And you're like, I think I can make that work, right? Is that, is that how you came That's up with that? That's not how I did that. That's a good <laughs> example. That was yeah. actually from the top on that one. <laughs> but you do it enough, then you start getting a feel for it. Mm-hmm. I had a teacher in, uh, in high school who was sort of like my, my mentor as a writer. And he's like, all you really do to become a good writer is emulate other writers that you like. And mm-hmm. I think that works in email. I think that works in ads. I think that works in every, every sort of thing. Like if you find something engaging, bookmark it, come back and then break it apart and say, why did I, why, what was, what about this like caught my interest? And I think that for, for a lot of brands, you're selling to yourself, right? So if, if you find it interesting, people will find it interesting. Your audience will find it interesting. And then you're like, okay, uh, I can do this. And then you try it and then you test it. Right. And mm-hmm. then you, 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 you try it yourself and, and that's it. Right. Like that's, that's how it works. Like you, no, no one's born a great writer. Like you, you just, you just steal. You, you steal and you steal and steal until no one can tell what you're stealing from. You know? Do you subscribe to a lot of email lists? Oh, oh my reason? God. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. Like 60 or 70 newsletters. Do you ever try and write back the people that wrote the email, like a specific email and say, hey, whoever wrote this email, you did a great job. I, okay. So there's a little bit of, um, like inside email marketing, but like most of those email addresses that you reply to like are dead. No one pays yeah, attention. Yeah, yeah. So like I have to hunt them down on LinkedIn and, and I'm like, Hey man, I really like that. And then <laughs> like that, there's like that, you know? Um, and then there's a lot of like, you know, solar, pr- 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 I can't print. Solo Solopreneurs. Pr- yeah, yeah. Solopreneurs who are doing um, really great work just, and this isn't their like main thing, you know? And I'm, I'm like, that's really good. You get a great job. Just mm-hmm. like there's these guys who I worked with with an ad agency, and they and they do um, canvas art, and they're like the, canvas art is their entire life, but they've been doing putting together a pretty good email list. My my inbox is a mess, right? Like, you know, <laughs> yeah. It's like every day I get email, and then but see the thing is too that you're competing with the we're all competing with each other for space, right? So I like there's especially with your competitors, you want to get on their email list and see what they're doing when they're sending, and then send after them so you bury them in the email. I mean, wow, yeah, it gets it gets kind of cutthroat, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So they're like, I you know somebody who sends at eleven thirty, you're like, okay, eleven forty five, I'm just gonna knock you down. Wow, yeah. and and you're like. And if you see them doing the same thing over and over again, it's probably because it works, mm-hmm. right? And so, so like, then you're gonna emulate. So emulate mm-hmm. or do your version of it that mm-hmm. you know, or like test it, right? So if you're like, for some reason, they keep sending a devil emoji with the rest with their, or whatever it is, you know, yeah. And you're like, they've done that four times. Clearly, this is working for them. So what's my version of that, right? Like, is it a lightning emoji? Is it a you know, <laughs> yeah. you know, whatever it is. But yeah, yeah, you've got like, get it's getting a view of the landscape is important, especially in, in email is cutthroat. You, you're only getting so many cl- people only click so many times in their inbox. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, you want to be one of those people, right? You want to be one of those clicks. You want to be one of those opens and everything. Yeah. I love the, just the thought of emojis and what that did to the English language yeah. <laughs> when it came to copywriting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I saw something on CNN the other day about how like courts are trying to d- determine whether if you send like a gun emoji to somebody, if that's threatening, Wow. Yeah, and things like that. That's, so. a, that's a huge debate. Yeah. Let's start to wrap it up. Sure. Um, to get to where you're at now from, let's say, before you got your very first copywriting gig, mm-hmm. what would you say? What would some advice be to somebody that wants to pursue what you're doing? If somebody wants to be a copywriter, you have to read. Like, you have to. And, like, I spend three or four hours a night in bed before I get to, like, sleep. You know, I, laid, I put my daughter to bed at 8 o'clock, kind of, like, wind down, and then until around midnight I read. What kind of books are you reading? I read a lot of fiction. And I think that the reason I do that is because it really, there's like, st- there's studies that show that it makes you more empathetic and that makes you like better at understanding audiences, right? And I know that, uh, you know, uh, I read a lot of nonfiction too uh, mm-hmm. and a lot of like email stuff because it, it is changing a lot. And there's like theories and things that, you know, are constantly changing. But at the end of the day, I'm not sending out emails that are brash, that don't need to be brash. I don't need them to be too ad salesy when they, they don't need to be. Bad writing is bad writing because people understand it's inauthentic. You know, there's all sorts of companies that just kill it when it comes to authenticity. Nike's always doing it. Like Nike made its brand on being authentic. Dove mm-hmm. kills it with authenticity. They, they don't come to you and they say, I'm going to sell you something. They say, this is what we believe in. And if you believe in this too, then join us, join yeah. our brand. And that all comes from knowing who you are, knowing who your audience is and how to convey that from one to the other, right? 
I would also then, then this comes from that um, primal branding book the who is the anti your brand who is the pagans of your brand who, hmm. who, and if you know exactly who isn't going to be in so if you're saying say you're working for apple sure. and i'm t- my, I'm answering for you but uh if say you're working for apple and then you send out an email to apple people and then you say something about windows mm-hmm. well you could say something that would trigger somebody and make people love your brand even more right that kind of thing you know? yeah and you can't understand what people think 100 percent, but you can get a good, yeah. better idea in, in communicating with them. The more you communicate, the better off. Based on the stats, I mean, if you don't have the stats, you, you can. It's all anecdotal, and, yeah. and anecdote doesn't do anything for you, you know. So you know, getting those stats and saying, okay, we're really getting a lot of, you know, uh, I'm sending out an email, hardly any unsubs, getting the clicks, getting the opens. That's the thing that you want to say, okay, why is this working for me? And then, like I said, do, doing that again, but again, adhering to who you are, mm-hmm. you know, never betraying who you are and never betraying the trust of your audience. Those are the key things to do. As far as being a better writer, you can't be a better writer without being a, a good reader. Um, and as far as the things that I'm reading, like I said, tons of fiction. Um, my uh, my sort of solopreneur uh, friends, they're always forcing me to read uh, nonfiction stuff. Um, it's not as entertaining, but it's sometimes it's, it's, getting, it's getting better. But um, for the most part, I say read everything you can get your hands on. The things that speak to you will be the things that you can steal from later. And it doesn't matter what it is. If it's an ad, if it's a Facebook ad, is it a billboard, you know, mm-hmm. whatever it is, whatever is speaking to you, then that's the thing you need to copy and take and, and make your own in some way. That's interesting because you're one of the first persons I've met where it actually makes sense to read fic- fiction. Yeah. And I like how you alluded to all your solopreneur friends. Yeah. Because it's, it's true. The uh, uh, In my line of work, I've been um, listening to a lot of the entrepreneur business, um, self-development podcasts and things of that nature. Mm-hmm. And for for good reason, they recommend reading nonfiction business mm-hmm. help. But that's for me, mainly, I knew nothing about business. So mm-hmm. I'm. it's like me going back to school again and mm-hmm. just learning about all the things that it takes to sure. be successful. Yeah. Um, but in your circumstance, I think it really cultivates the way to create a good story, whether that be in five words or a right. whole novel. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And it is, it's storytelling, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, uh, that's a whole different, you know, lecture, <laughs> right? yeah, yeah. you know, but at the end of the day, um, you know, it, it, it's all about audience and what your audience expects and how you meet those expectations and how you pleasantly subvert those expectations. Like mm-hmm. those are the things you need to start thinking of and stay away from cliche you know, if, if, you know, stay away from things that just language that has no meaning whatsoever. I mean, and, and the good news is there's still tools out there that can help you do that. Like Hemingway app helps with cliche. Mm-hmm. Um, there's like Wikipedia has just a list of cliches, um, business jargon and things like that. Stay away from it. Um, the, you know, those are just, it's just filler words that don't do anything. It's wasting everybody's time. Um, you know, so, th- you know, there's, thankfully there's a ton of tools that out there that will just, that'll help you be a better writer t- on top of reading and deconstructing the things that you read that you find, you know, particularly motivating or moving. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, another question I want to ask sure. is within the last year, what's the best investment, either business or personally that you've done that you've seen a great return on? Hmm. Can I, can I be cheesy and say my daughter? Sure. That, yeah. 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 You know, <laughs> um, I, I think that, um, having a daughter and <laughs> not that know. we're saying that having children is an investment, it, but <laughs> it, it, you know, well, it is if they turn out rich. Right? <laughs> um, but you know, I, I think that I'm reading a lot to her and I think that that's been helpful in a weird way. Um, and, um, you know, the, the, be- the best investment as far as my, um, my time goes is, you know, even though I, I do have a, a nine month old and, and a busy wife and two dogs and two cats and just like a circus at the house mm-hmm. is like making sure that I put time into myself still and say, you know, I want I want to stay sharp as a writer and putting down time to, you know, and, and sticking to it. So investing in my own time, too. I know that's kind of selfish sounding, but, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, making sure that I have that two or three hours uh, at, at, in the evening to read and write and 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 stay you know on top uh, and and stay you know relevant with everything that's happening in in email and in copy um you know i think that has has paid its dividends as far as finding a job that i love and um you know 
finding clients for freelance work all the time and that kind of stuff. You know, my grandfather always said that if you find something really interesting, you're going to be interesting. And I think that people are drawn to other interesting people. Very so, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> interesting indeed. Where can people find you? Convictincanon.com is um, my email. I'm sort of like super swamp right now. I have like 16 clients, so um, I can't take anything on right now, but I can definitely answer email questions um, and copy questions. And I'm, uh, you know, I, I like to make myself um, available to, to look at copy too. Uh, if people ever have qu- questions regarding like, hey, does this suck or is this good or what? How can I be a better writer? Uh, you know, I come from a, a academia, so I taught um, creative writing for a few years and uh, and argumentative writing. So if people ever want to uh, email me, it's n- uh, nick dot at convictandcanon.com. Thank you so much for your time. There's yeah, definitely obviously. a lot for people that are just getting into or they want to step up their copywriting game. Sure. I'm, everybody's putting some sort of caption underneath their Instagram photo. Yeah. So you're, 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 you've been yeah. utilizing copy at some point. Yeah. But uh, hopefully with this podcast, you have some new tools to add to that toolkit and make some better copy. I know yeah. I do. Thank All you right. so much for your All time. Right. And until next episode, if you did like this episode, you could share it out with a friend. You could email them on your email list. That's right. And say, hey, I learned about emailing. (laughs) Make sure to test. (laughs) Yes, exactly. And if they do click through uh, onto the podcast, that'd be awesome. Thank you guys so much for listening. Until next episode, live a life of abundance. and I'll see you guys next time.